Last year, I was on a street corner in New York, having just eaten a slice of pizza. I looked at all the cars streaming south down 7th Avenue and wondered to myself why there couldn't be one lane headed north, the direction I wanted to go. You know, why couldn't there be just one counterflow lane? Uh, most of the streets and avenues in New York are one-way streets. For instance, 7th Avenue runs south, 6th Avenue goes north. This street, it was 25th Street, goes west, and 24th Street goes east. Once I got to 25th Street, I'd want to go east towards 6th Avenue, again against traffic. Then maybe I forgot my wallet at the pizza place, and with no easy way to do a U-turn, I'd want to go south on 6th Avenue, and then again the wrong way along 24th Street. Ah, my wallet. Going against traffic is convenient. But if everyone always could drive against traffic, it would be chaos, right? With cars going every which way. So, New York's system of one-way streets looks like this. But if you add a counterflow lane on every block, it begins to look like this. That looks more like the typical city layout in the United States. Detroit, for example, follows this pattern. Around the world, people are comfortable with this traffic layout. But what happens at the intersections? Well, people can enter from any direction. They can go right, straight, or turn left. This guy can also go right, straight, or turn left, like this. And same deal with these guys. Explore all the possibilities, and you find that the cars in an intersection naturally travel in the form of a roundabout. An added benefit is the ability to make an easy U-turn. Without roundabouts, reversing direction can be time-consuming and is relatively dangerous because you have to cross oncoming traffic. Notice that cars travel around the roundabout in a counterclockwise direction, so let's indicate that with a rotational arrow. I like to call it a spiral. Similarly, if you look at the sides of the city block and connect all the lanes that touch it, you see another spiral that spins in the opposite direction of the roundabouts. So we represent roundabouts with an arrow spinning this way, and city blocks rotate the other way. Now, to understand firsthand why a city block rotates this way, you can walk up to a road and then walk in the same direction as traffic without crossing any intersections, but continuing to walk with traffic. Sooner or later, you will find yourself back in the same position as where you started. But people in England will find that their blocks spin the other way. If we draw up some English city blocks, we'll see that they spin the same direction as American roundabouts. So, if both American city blocks and English roundabouts spin to the right, what's the difference between the two? I thought about this for a long time, and here's the answer. There's no difference except size. One is small, and the other is big. Here's a web page I made to help show the difference between cities in America and England. Right now, it's depicting an American city with roundabouts that spin to the left. If we make it show an English city, note that only the relative sizes change. There's the same number of roundabouts and city blocks. You might think of the difference between England and America like this. England has tiny city blocks and huge roundabouts with buildings on them. It's easy to understand that a roundabout is a circular one-way street, but even with the graphic, it's harder to understand that city blocks are also circular one-way streets. In reality, city blocks are so big that they squish against each other between each roundabout, and their touching borders form what are commonly called two-way streets. It's like when a roll of paper towel has flat sides whenever it's pressed firmly against other rolls of paper towel. To understand better how expanding American roundabouts to the size of city blocks would make American roads feel like English roads, we can draw a few American blocks, and then draw the same diagram only with the sizes of the roundabouts and city blocks reversed. Look at the area where the American city blocks touch, and you find what's thought of as an American two-way street. But in the other diagram, it will be the giant square roundabouts which touch, and where they touch will look exactly like an English two-way street. So. If you were to shrink all the city blocks in America while expanding the roundabouts to city block size, driving in America would feel exactly like driving in England. Oncoming traffic would be on your right side, and roundabouts would spin to the right. What is actually happening when you get onto or off of a roundabout? When you enter a roundabout, you're merging onto a circular one-way street. It is the same merging action you would perform if your lane were to end. Voila, you're on the roundabout. At each part of a roundabout that touches a neighboring city block, a driver can decide to continue circling the roundabout or to begin circling that city block. You can see how the cars that continue circling their city block by taking the first exit of the roundabout don't really employ the roundabout at all. The other cars merge from spinning city blocks onto the roundabout and back onto the blocks again. A roundabout has one exit for every spinning city block that it touches. 
If it touches no city blocks, drivers will be trapped on a circular one-way road. In Geminos, France, I saw a two-exit roundabout sandwiched between two city blocks. It allowed drivers to perform a U-turn without leaving the road or blocking traffic. In this case, it also provided a safe area where drivers could pick up or drop off hikers. There was a trail that started from the large side of the roundabout. A cul-de-sac is a one-exit roundabout swallowed nearly entirely by a spinning city block. Walk with traffic along the perimeter of the city block and you will wrap around the cul-de-sac and pop out again onto the surface of the city block. The purpose of a cul-de-sac is to allow drivers to make a U-turn without having to perform a three-point turn. A roundabout with no exits is just NASCAR, a race series based around circular one-way streets that spin to the left. The world's most famous roundabout is Charles de Gaulle Etoile at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris and touches 12 city blocks, and so it has 12 exits. What about the magic roundabout? How does that work? So the magic roundabout inspires fear in drivers around the world. It was conceived 50 years ago by a British traffic engineer named Frank Blackmore, and even though it was complex, it was shown to flow more cars than the large conventional roundabout it replaced. It flowed 6,200 cars per hour rather than 5,100 of the previous junction. The common explanation goes something like this. The magic roundabout in Swindon is diabolical, where you might expect to find a normal roundabout. There are five mini roundabouts arranged one big central roundabout, but the central one goes in reverse. That might sound complex, but a roundabout going in reverse is not a roundabout at all, but a city block. Topologically, the magic roundabout in Swindon is a tiny five-sided city block with a roundabout at each corner. There are even five small streets that connect the mini roundabouts, one at each side of the central city block. To underline this point for unfamiliar drivers, the center line of each street has been made into an elongated concrete island. Magic roundabouts are able to flow more cars per hour because they allow road users to take the shortest route to their exit. In a conventional roundabout, a road user who wants to take the last exit must travel nearly all the way around the roundabout. This means the road user will spend more time in the intersection. Multiply that small increase in time by enough users, and it becomes apparent that at any given moment, there will be more road users vying for space inside the intersection, and that it will become clogged more rapidly. A magic roundabout makes better use of an intersection's footprint than does a conventional roundabout. Swindon's famous magic roundabout isn't the only one of its kind. Here's another version at a four-way intersection. In this case, the short streets between each mini roundabout are easier to recognize, which makes clearer the fact that the central island is a city block. In fact, any city block with a roundabout at each corner can be thought of as the central island of a magic roundabout. Otherwise, it would be instead surrounded by a huge circular one-way street, and getting off at the last exit of that city block-sized roundabout would be needlessly time-consuming. If this were a regular roundabout, and you arrived at this corner wanting to go here, you'd have to drive all the way around the lake. But because this is a magic roundabout, you can take the shortest path. The block even rotates the same way as a magic roundabout central island. Imagine the frustration of having to travel all the way around the lake just to go here, and you'll appreciate the cleverness of the magic roundabout. All right, I get it, I get it. Roundabouts are like city blocks, they just spin the other way. Magic roundabouts are actually city blocks surrounded by mini roundabouts. You know what? I love roundabouts. I want to live on one. Is that even possible? Good news, you can live on a roundabout. There are roundabouts in England with pubs and houses and buildings. If it's hard to visualize how one might access a roundabout-based habitat, think again about a NASCAR track. The track is a circular one-way street and the pit lane is a big merging lane that lets race cars slow down if they need to enter the garage, which, along with the infield, is in the center of the roundabout. Before merging back onto the roundabout itself, race cars accelerate down the pit lane. At first glance, the thought of living on a roundabout seems uncomfortably constrictive. You and your neighbors would be completely surrounded by pavement, and you would have to get onto and then off of the roundabout to go anywhere at all. However, if you live on a normal city block or neighborhood, there's a pavement spiral around you and your neighbors already, which means that you probably can't get anywhere interesting from your house without crossing the road or driving through an intersection. In effect, you already live on a roundabout, though if you're in America, it's a giant English roundabout and it spins to the right. 
Thus, even if you lived on a real roundabout, you wouldn't be any more isolated from the world than you already are. It's a sobering realization. Cars wrap around each block, and you have to deal with them if you want to go anywhere at all. Still, swinging your way through roundabouts in a car is great fun, and much better than a traffic light. Some people think roundabouts are tricky, but it's worth it for the time saved, the safety, and the feeling of freedom.